You also speak of technological identity and how our digital lives uh, overwhelm local stories and traditions, mm -hmm. you know, like, you know, we are more worried about what's happening out in, you know, the riots in France or Palestine rather than our backyard politics. In the Indo-Pacific context, how should countries like India and New Zealand balance protecting authentic cultural narrative with embracing global platforms and AI? I think the, the model the New Zealand government has adopted for strengthening, safeguarding, celebrating, enriching its, its traditions, the Maori traditions, the, the traditions of its indigenous folks, is the model that all of us must carefully incubate in our own countries. I think we have histories, we have, we are much storied in terms of our journeys, and we need to ensure that those stories are available to all to benefit from. Uh, it doesn't mean that you don't take the good that awaits you. It means that you also continue to cherish and, and, and respect the path that you have walked down from. And, and I, and I think that's the, that's the, the danger in, in the digital societies we are, we are heading towards. Basically, uh, you know, when I was growing up, my, my, my share, my, you know, the, my, uh, my, my grandmother's, um, my grandmother's village had, a, when she came, when she entered our home, our, our family as, as a bride, she came with a, she came with a, a, a chef from a particular community who, uh, basically told her stories of our mythology, of our religious books, of our, of our, of, of the valor, of courage, of cowardice, of treachery, of betrayal, of culture, cuisine, and everything else. And he was 70 and I was a young kid and he told me those stories as well. My grandmother and I grew up hearing the same stories. Uh, and we were connected through that even though we grew up in very different times, right? Our connection was that we had the same stories. We could connect to the same locality, the same country, the same, same society. And we had the same ownership for, for, for the people that we were. Now, I wonder if I was growing up today, would those stories still be available to me? I don't have the chef and, and he's not going to tell, and, and anyone who does cook for me is not going to tell me those stories. He's likely to be from a, a very different uh, cultural context. I am going to grow up reading stories on Instagram and Instagram algorithms are going to decide the stories that tell me that shape my, my childhood, that shape my teenage years, that shape my future. Uh, I would, Sometimes because of, of that exposure to this whole mediated society that I live in, perhaps have greater affinity to developments and to incidents and to events far, far away from the land and the locality I was born to. I think governments need to invest in the locality, in the stories of the locality, in creators who tell stories of locality. There's money to be made. I was seeing a YouTube ad which says that 65,000 Indians last year earned more than 100,000 as royalty and it's growing by 60 odd percent every year. So there are there is money to be made by telling stories of the past. There is a market there. People want to know who they are. They are all dislocated in this world, right? Uh, the, the minister doesn't know whether India is home or New Zealand is home, right? And, 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 and of course, uh, the, uh, and I don't mean it in a, in a negative sense. I, I'm sure he would find it as comfortable to be in many locations in this world as he is in his home country. So do I. I do 40 countries a year and I'm as comfortable uh, in any Hilton around the world, right? <laughs> so, 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 so we are, we are citizens of, of, of the, 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 you know, the sovereign republic of Hilton, the sovereign republic of intercontinental in this case, right? So my point here is that we have to invest in our story. It doesn't mean that we have to disrespect other stories. I think that was the problem with globalization of the past, that we were told to forget who we were and to become something common and new which was completely alien to, to our realities. I think we have to remember who we are. We have to accommodate the difference between someone else and celebrate the future together. We are headed in the to the same place. We may have different uh, ramps and pathways to get there, but we must collaborate to strengthen our journeys as we go to... Shamat Kwaif. 
Minister, coming to you, the last two years had seen a series of significant steps uh, forward in the New Zealand India relationship. And, you know, talking about stories, what do you see as the defining moment in the strengthening partnership? Well, uh, look, I think it was uh, when we made the decision to say our, our relationship with India would be a strategic priority, you know, because it sends a very, very important, very clear signal. Uh, I think previously the signals from the government, the previous government, uh, Labour, were mixed. I don't know that they were purposefully done, but it doesn't matter because it doesn't matter why, you know, that you're meaning to say something is often the way it is received. And so that set about a course of thought across government about how we would achieve that. If it's a strategic priority, what does that mean? I mean, we were asking ourselves a question. Is it just about trade? Is it just about defense? Uh, if it hasn't been defence before, why not? What does that mean? Uh, you know, can we do things together in Antarctic? Well, what is the role we should play together in the Pacific with the islands? For me, uh, what does that do? Does that change my approach to uh, the WTO? Should I be more thoughtful about some of the positions India have uh, and so on, right? So, so it challenges in terms of you think deeply about that. And our sister very quickly got to the point that said um, that there are many things we could do and should be doing at, without finding a reason why we weren't. I, um, I, I'm, I think I'm quite persistent because as they were thinking about that, I started getting on the plane and going to visit and going to talk and meeting each other around the place. And actually, you know, think about not where the breakthrough was, but where it became obvious that we had an opportunity to strengthen the relationship, including in trade, it uh, was um, um, Minister Goyalai had said we should have a dinner together somewhere, in India, wherever it would be. Uh, and trade ministers often say these things, oh, we'll meet up somewhere, have a dinner. So uh, New Zealand and I was invited to the G7 uh, trade ministers meeting in Italy, down at the very bottom of Italy, and looking across, just across the water was Sicily. Uh, and uh, Piesh was there as well, and his lovely wife had travelled with him, and my partner was with me. Anyway, we, we had a, a, a formal bilateral meeting sitting outside with Sicily behind us. So there's photographs of he and I smiling with Sicily sitting there. I'm not saying we learned something, but anyway, the point of this is, and we're chatting and just being the election, and so I spent most of the meeting that we had, neither of us looking at our notes given to us by officials, talking about his election and had won, because again, we're both parliamentarians, we like that sort of stuff, and, and so on. And anyway, as we were talking, I said, to, we had agreed we are going to have a dinner somewhere, and I said, oh, how long are you here for? We should do it here, somewhere in Europe. We can do it in Sicily. But he, uh, I was going the next day, and he was staying for a few days before he went home. And I said, well, that doesn't work. But I said, but well, what are you doing next week? His wife said, well, I'll come to India, and we'll have dinner. And he said, what do you mean? And I, you, you remember, he already thinks I'm crazy if I drive. I said, well, I said, well, all right, home, I'll be in Dubai. That's quite a short flight. So he said, all right, we'll do it this day. And then he said, oh, I said, that won't work. That's budget day. I'll be busy. And I said, well, the next day. So we agreed. Anyway, uh, uh, jump forward an hour or so, there was a very big formal dinner. And we were hosted by the, the, um, the uh, Italian foreign minister, there are the G7 countries, but many others there. But this, hours later, uh, uh, the dinner didn't start till 10 o'clock for a range of reasons, including that's the best time to eat in, in, in Italy. So we're sitting there on the seaside. It's very warm. Everyone's jet lagged. We've been tra we're in meetings all day. It's very hot. And they decide that they will bring um, a very special band from the Navy to play for us and that they will play a song for each of one of the seven countries. So Minister Goyal and I sitting beside each other, and then uh, beside him is, um, uh, beside me is the WTO Director General, and then his wife and my partner on the other side. And the lights are down, we're outside, and the music goes on. And he and I both fall asleep instantly. And the moment the music finished, we both start clapping, <laughs> and that fall asleep. And then the, the two partners, the ladies are talking, oh, they work so hard and so difficult, and 
And uh, Anna, my partner, says, does this happen a lot? He says, he's always falling asleep, says uh, Seema. And to which uh, Anna says, he's exactly the same. Right? So, uh, anyway, as it finished, uh, I sort of, we finished and we'd agreed I was going to come and see him. Everyone's laughing and they can't see us because we're at the front row. Anyway, I, I sort of said, um, shook hands and we'll see you for a soon. And I said to uh, Mrs. Goyal, I said, so lovely, lovely to meet you. Thank you for letting me sleep beside your husband. Right? Anyway, the, 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 the point of this is that the two, the two ladies have been exchanging messages and so on. So, so that comes back to what I said earlier, right? Actually, years ago, trade, globalization. Globalization used to be in the good old days when actually it was growing well for people and we're seeing industrialization, the trade was going, you know, cross border trade was increasing significantly. It was about what I can get from you, what we can get instead of them. Mm -hmm. And that is part of the reason that actually we saw economies grow and wealth grow through trade so quickly because it was very, very competitive. Actually, you look at what happened to the WTO and other kinds of the world, and there has been a movement against globalization. Mm -hmm. And the, the movement against globalization was for the wrong reasons, because globalization was not a bad thing. It did grow wealth. It did create things. There are medicines today that wouldn't have existed otherwise through competition. Competition is a good thing. But one-sided competition where somebody has an advantage over somebody else because they are developed versus the, the less developed or because they are wealthy or technology more advanced against someone else doesn't work. And that's why you've seen the pushback. What we are doing with India at the moment, what India is doing with us, what we're doing together, is not about what I can get from you or we from them. It's about how can we create something that takes the benefits, the advantages or an opportunity of globalization and apply it in such a way that everybody is a winner, not just one side. And that's, uh, that's, that's the breakthrough, those conversations, not as succinctly as you have explained it, but those conversations that I've had with Minister Goyal, our two prime ministers has, and that is filtering through to our negotiators because they have been told, we want to do this deal.